experts from South Asian affairs, but I have to thank many of my Indian colleagues for having been a host and a teacher to me, and I have to thank the founding president, young Raymond of Amsterdam, my, my closest colleague, for having initiated me to uh, South Asia. So, what I want to talk to you more is the uh, crisis in welfare states in the West and the absence of welfare arrangements outside of your American relative absence. Uh, first of all, I want to conjure up an image. And the image is of people in overcrowded boats trying to cross the Mediterranean or the South China Seas, Pacific, and drowning in great numbers or being returned. Uh, I'm saying being returned, they are not being returned, they're simply sent off to the high seas again. Uh, it's a very visible tragedy. Almost no one can say that he or she didn't know, we know, uh, and we are aware of it. It is a tragedy in huge numbers, hundreds of thousands of people are expected to cross the Mediterranean, and many thousands are expected to die of the way. It is generally framed as a humanitarian problem, which it is. It is also a criminal problem, which complicates matters of movements. And then there is something which you do not see on images usually, but which is going on in similar or even larger numbers, and that is other poor people migrating, this time mostly over land from the village to the city. And many of you know much better than I, the teeming crowds in these huge Asian cities that are more than 10 million inhabitants, many of them eking out the marginal existence, which apparently still may be preferred to their existence in the village. So there is another silence uh, and somewhat less spectacular movement of the poor. Both are images that inspire enormous anxiety, not so long the poor, sometimes they inspire hope for a better future, but among those who are established, and who I simply will go for the sake of argument, rich people who have a certain uh, security in life who may even possess some means of existence. Uh, the Europeans in their fortress Europe are very frightened. Americans in their fortress America have built a huge wall which spans the entire borders with Mexico, trying to keep the Latinos out. And again, the Latinos are of probably an entirely different species than the American people who are part of the American population by thousands of Latino expression. Uh, so this is a, I'm tempted to say, modern anxiety, but I'm precisely going to argue that it's a very, very old anxiety. Because uh, for the rich, for people who in older times were possessed of the land, there was a continuous threat that land was poor people might invade, rob them, burn their farms, uh, rob them of the harvest, uh, bring about horrible plagues. There was no idea of prevention, but there was a magic anxiety that disease might spread with the experience of the growing poor. Uh, there was a fear that old women would cast a spell on the farmers. They were called witches. And I have always thought that probably this belief that led to the killing of so many elderly women probably saved many more because at least people were afraid of these totally helpless creatures. 
and so we try to assuage them because they were magically powerful. So here you have the, the, the uh, writers of the apocalypse uh, teeming invaders, uh, spreaders of disease, robbers, rebels, uh, migration, rebellion, crime, and contagion have been of old the theirs that poor people inspired in more or less established. And again, there are echoes, or mirror image of these art, uh, archetypical fears and anxieties <coughs> in contemporary times. But well, suddenly, there were extremely poor countries which were spreading a horrible plague. And by the time it appeared that the plague was out of bounds, meaning, meaning it would not be limited to these three rest countries that might spread all over the world with travelers, by that time, yes, a certain mysterious surge, for example, in the United States, which prompted, for example, the US authorities to intervene in this Ebola plague in Liberia and in India and Sierra Leone. I saw in many, many airports warnings that you, uh, if you had any sign of fever, whatever, you should immediately report to the authorities. All of this was absolutely not justified by medical idea, but enormously helped to create great anxiety, which never got the WHO to move, but at least the American authorities to do something about it. More or less successful, but political. Again, what I should call a classical fear. Now, if I'm saying that there are surprising continued continuities over 10,000 years in those anxieties the poor inspired in the, in the rich. I'm not at all saying that they were the same. I'm saying there is a thread which you can follow and which changes in every which, which way uh, wrinkles and circulates. But there is a thread. Thread and there is a threat. So in this approach uh, poor people inspire great anxieties in rich people, meaning people who own lands, for example, in early agricultural society. But the rich people cannot easily defend themselves against the threats of the poor on their own. You cannot defend <coughs> in your farm on your own and keep out all the roaming wretched and miserable that are passing by on the highway. You must, together with other established people, create some kind of arrangements to sort of control the threat and animate the poor. And at the village level, that used to be Irish relief, poor relief. Uh, and that was a measure of collective action, one of the interesting problems of the theories of collective action is how you can ever emerge. And in my early book, Care of the State, I tried to show that as people get together to look at a common problem, first of all, they tend to realize that they are interdependent. They become, become aware of their interdependence. And secondly, they try to persuade one another to do something about it. What's very often very important at such a moment is the existence of a shared norm about how the burden should be carried. And for example, in Christian teaching, there is such a norm. Uh, every peasant should be invited to his table and says, uh, uh, the people that happen to knock on his door, Everyone should give one tenth of his harvest to the poor, etc., etc. These are the uh, and such norms help to coordinate the behavior of established people in order to somehow control them. Because there is always a suspicion that some might not contribute to the collective action and that profit from the efforts of others. Very possible dilemma. 
and may discourage those who are intrinsically willing to undertake something uh, from doing anything at all. Now, in classical economic theory, this is sufficient in the argument to conclude that collective action will never occur. The fact that it occur all the time never discouraged economists from their rational choice ideas until uh, Eleanor Ostrom came around, who wrote a book about the managing of the commons, the evolution of the bridge, and showed precisely what I'm saying now that a collectivity may emerge precisely in the process of undertaking collective action for the establishment of some collective good. And it may do so by a very mechanism which is very familiar to all of you, because most of you are economists, which is called social interaction. Gossip, critique, uh, taking people to account, all these forms of social control which you are professionals are familiar with and which help to uh, create an emergent collectivity, which in the process of this emergence create collective good. Parish belief was one such form. Uh, another form on a somewhat larger scale of uh, dealing with the poor were the walls that surrounded cities, which are usually interpreted as a defense against uh, foreign armies, which were constantly a form of keeping the Roman poor away, obviously a collective defense in England. For a long time, people had to deal through voluntary collective action with the threats of the Roman poor. They exempted from those Roman poor what they called the deserving poor. And the deserving poor was an interesting category. Let's put it that way. First of all, they were dosa, not the doves. Uh, they wouldn't drink, shout, break windows. They would conform to the norms of the charitable authorities. Second, they could not help that they didn't work, they were incapacitated. Either they were children, or they were sick, or they were invalids, or they were elderly. So there was an excuse for the fact that they didn't work by the sweat of their brow. And thirdly, they were local, our own people. Those are the deserving three-dimensional model. Again, I think it has survived for about 10,000 years uh, as the model of those people who deserve to get welfare uh, benefits local and national residents who somehow cannot work and who uh, are not propagates criminals and loudmouth uh, rebels. There are two one times one of those threads of continuity. Throughout this history, what occurs is a spectacular increase in scale. Uh, took you along to imagine small agricultural villages, which are uh, maybe on a scale of a thousand people. I briefly mentioned towns where maybe ten or hundred thousand people live. <coughs> Kingdoms of old, where maybe a million people were effectively organized. So there is an increase in scale of the number of people who can be effectively coordinated politically organized. And then it appears the nation states as the temporary culmination of this increase in the scale of effectively coordinated action. And of course, the nation state is precisely the locus of what we now call welfare states. The welfare state is very closely connected with the formation of nation states. And then I think, this my private fantasy, we may be witnessing the dawn of a fifth level of coordination, which I have called giants. They are super nation states. And they function not like a 
works also in the nation states function in the order of tens of maybe a hundred million people. The Chinese function at the level of a billion. And I can think of four. The United States, not so much with the number of inhabitants, 320 million, but it's hugely in China. Maybe the European Union, maybe, maybe. and of course, India. I think what occurs in those four entities is in a way new. It's on a new level of social integration, which the world has not seen before. Probably each of these giants contains more inhabitants than the entire world at the dawn of the 19th century. There's huge needs. Now, each time when a new level of coordination emerges, similar problems of collective action present themselves. And the problems of collective action are typical, particularly in the face of transition, when people are aware of their interdependence, but as yet are not effectively coordinated at the relevant level. So individuals in the great village. Uh, towns and villages in, say, early modern kingdoms, trying to uh, coordinate, their act, coordinate their military actions or their actions in defense against the poor. Or, say, nation states at present trying to coordinate their actions uh, while they cannot, are as yet not effectively coordinated at the relevant level. The most beautiful example of such a transitional stage in which collective action problems present themselves is precisely the European Union, which in certain respects is already integrated and can deal in a coordinated way with the problem that presents itself, but in other respects is helplessly divided into national states. Uh, one might look at the euro and the banking crisis in this region, but I'm reminding you of the problem of immigration, where the northern states like Sweden can maybe posture uh, very generous, knowing that it will take a little while before these teeming nuts will reach the shores. But if you're Italy, or Greece, the problem is much more direct. So here you see the, the, the European uh, member states at the moment when there is not as yet a perfect union, groping for ways to coordinate their actions in sort of controlling this common threat. Because the threat is the drowning people are uh, perceived as a mortal threat to the jobs and the purity of European women. That's also the whole theme of the foreign invaders. So welfare states on the national level, and here I skip a part of the argument, are the combination of what you can call the collectivizing process, the attempt at ever larger levels of integration, find solutions for the problem of the poor, which by now I have explained in the first place the problem of the rich, the word of the threats that emanates or are believed to emanate from the presence of the poor in their midst. And I should immediately add that the presence of the poor also holds opportunities and promises for the rich, because they are workers. An upright man is supposed to be is a man who can walk. So he can walk, he can walk. Since he can walk, he can walk to the next village and he can lose his there. And since he can walk, he can also fight and he is dangerous. And here you have exactly the difference of the, let's say, body of the poor. Walking, working, fighting as a man. Now, the question which will probably be on your mind is how come these uh, welfare 
welfare states have evolved in Europe to a much larger degree than meets the eye in the United States, and much less so in uh, the countries of the South and of the East. Here's one I would very modestly want to uh, bring up your attention. A little volume that Lisa Rice and Nick Moore called Elite Perceptions of Poverty and Inequality. It was a research group of which I was a part <coughs> and which decided to interview elites, leaders in the Philippines and Bangladesh, South Africa, Haiti and Brazil about their attitudes towards the poor because that might hold one element of the explanation. But there are a number of obvious explanations. The very first one is that some countries simply may be uh, geologically and geographically not as suitable for creating riches as others. The Sahara or the Kalahari Desert is much less uh, suitable to sustain a large number of people than, say, the East Coast of the USA. There is no, some truth in the saying that geography is invested. The second is that when non-Western countries industrialized, they had to catch up and compete with already ingrained, established industrial countries. It's much harder to get a car from an airplane industry if there are already airplane and car industries somewhere else. <clears throat> the third reason uh, is <coughs> that Asian states in the West were simply better off and a bit wealthier than many in the East and in the South. But there was also a matter of time. And in the present century, or in the last half of the last century, one very important thing happened. And that was the total demise of communism. I mean, not even the communists. Just that we must ask, we must not ask the Chinese leadership if they believe in communism. We ask most cardinals in the Vatican if they believe in Catholicism. But it has been communism after 1989 has completely developed. But this has had enormous consequence for the workers' movement the social democratic movement and the social Christian movement all over the world. There is no longer the idea of an alternative to capitalism. And that means that the elites in Western countries, at least with problems, other countries in the world, are no longer afraid of anybody setting up a really alternative movement for truly different so we live at the time of the end of history, in a time in which at least for some time it appeared that the free market ideology, the orthodoxy, the free market, was completely hegemonic. It has suffered some deaths. It's recuperated its patients to develop. Uh, and there's a question really for the discouragement of social movements, also social democratic movements, anti-communist social democratic movements all over. Because the threats, the looming threat of communism has disappeared, and that has made world movements a little less threatening. The second thing is the fact of globalization. The outsourcing of work towards the East and the South, which has very much weakened, weakened and eroded the uh, organized workers in the West. And what it shows is that labor is not quite as mobile 
as capitals. Capital can move all over the world in its physical appearance of factories and, and, and uh, goods and commodities with the speed of an airplane or at least a ship in its more abstract quality as uh, uh, financial capital. It moves as fast as electronics can bear it, and labor does not. Although, of course, we started conjuring up an image of labor on the move, because these poor people, if they're not busy swimming and saving themselves, those same, same arms, those same bodies are potential workers. That's their attraction, and that's their threat. They may compete with other workers, but they may also be hired for a so, in the present phase of globalization, what's of the essence is that labor is at a decisive, structural disadvantage compared to capital. <clears throat> then, at the level of ideology, there is an orthodoxy of free marketeering and anti-welfare statism, which I must say, with a sh shameful face, is supported by many economists, although not by most academic economists, uh, and which has very effectively uh, cut off many of the alternative visions of the economic organization. There is a true raison d'etre, real treason of the world. Uh, one can also see that even in the social democratic movement, political leaders are not, will not hesitate at all after their state of politics to take a job, you know, to declare uh, people like uh, <coughs> Bill Clinton, Schroeder, where they get paid millions, and the message is clear. First of all, if you need money for your election campaigns, we know how. Second, there is life after politics. So keep in mind, two or three years, we have a job coming for you. All these things undermine the social, uh, the social movements. And they may do so in very similar ways to the salvation of the hearts of the world. But there is more. There is a problem that the elites in non-Western countries, the South and the East, come from a long tradition uh, in which certain attitudes are shaped and have hardened, which are very hard to uh, reconcile with welfare states. Uh, in this little research, which I put uh, out to you, what comes over in most of the countries is first of all that urban elites have hardly any idea of what life of rural poor is like. They tend to idealize rural poverty. That's to say, oh look, those people live, many have not too many goods. But if you just spit out a tomato a kernel and a tomato plant will grow, they can feed themselves all over the place. This is uh, secondly. The rural poor are not like you and me. I assume that none of you is rural. Uh, they don't mind suffering. They look differently at death. They look, they take faith as it comes. I was fascinated when I read this, because frankly, as a child in school in Amsterdam, this is exactly what I learned about Asians. They don't mind to be poor. They have a different attitude towards death. But this is the way life is for they're not like you and me, uh, which reflects on the relative beliefs, uh, uh, relationship of, say, Western countries to Eastern countries. And then the idea that there might be some responsibility of elites for the faith of the poor is very much absent, there is no ideology. On the contrary, uh, Christian ideology uh, very much stresses in this particular elite uh, 
nation. That yes, of course, uh, life is hard for the poor, but they will be more than amply compensated in life after death. And therefore, you should be glad to be poor, because you. And indeed, there is a saying. A camel will pass through the gates of heaven more easily than a rich man through the eyes of the life and tries to do so. I always interpret it as criticism to the rich, but they interpret it entirely different. They say, look, we're poor people. We'll never get to heaven. A camel gets through the gates more easily. Those poor people, they have all their chances. I never had to figure it out that way. Uh, so they adhere to an interest of religion, which takes responsibility of their shoulders, which basically denies any kind of common humanity, but reverses it and says the poor are blessed, blessed be the meek and poor, and Christ's teachings, in my heart, are interpreted completely the opposite way I always thought they ought to be interpreted. So there are very long continuities also in the elite attitudes towards the poor as they appear, and they are very strongly supported by economic hegemonic economic theory, which argues we must not uh, institute welfare arrangements. They will constitute a break in economic development. We must not protect domestic production because it will slow down economic growth. And they not entirely a true or a true. Um, and if only or we open up the economy, if only we take away any <clears throat> limits on free entrepreneurship, then the economy will fl flourish and the wealth will trickle down. Now, I think much of this part of the economy is true, except for the wealth will trickle down. Somehow, it never trickles, it doesn't need to rain, it doesn't need to pour, and uh, the, the, the poverty of... It is true that in some, under some conditions, established working class and middle class problems, but there remains a poor <coughs> underclass which does not at all profit from this. Yeah, this is not exactly an optimistic account, I'm afraid. Uh, but a rather pessimistic one. Uh, I give ample time to question, uh, I hope that a more positive and more optimistic account will come from your remarks and questions. If you're still free to say whatever you want. Well, 
I need those 15 steps to think a little bit. Uh, the, the, there is a overriding theme of fear in the confrontation with those millions of huddled masks. I was rereading the poem that Emma Lazarus wrote uh, for the Statue of Liberty, which is all about welcoming and welcoming immigrants and how different it was with their to these huddled masses on the teeming shores coming to America. Uh, <clears throat> what a positive time that was, by the way. But on, on one of the this theme of fear, among entrepreneurs and among the successful part of the working class, there may also be the realization that these are the people we need as working hands, in fact, as uh, uh, now that there are so many women working, there's of course an acute need, you know, the women say the husband should do it, to have people help uh, uh, you know, care for the children, keep it clean. So there is also always the realization that these people have promised to them, that there isn't uh, they're used to it. And at the same time, that people have a great capacity not to know what they don't want to know. It's called denial. Uh, and it must be, uh, so denial is a difficult problem because it is what Sartre called Mauvais Foi, that faith, and he said, uh, not to know what you know and to know what you don't know. Meaning you're being dishonest. You know very, very well what is going on in the countryside. Let's not talk. It's not a subject for dinner after. But let's have more pleasant things to talk about. Or these people don't really suffer. That's the way they are. Uh, I can tell you when this truth hit me. Uh, many uh, thousands of Dutch people to enjoy the occupation of uh, Indonesia were internment camps. These were concentration camps, not extermination camps. But Dutch people became very skinny. And that, because in some of those camps, in a good part of the time, there was a lack of nutrition. And there were pictures of these Dutch people who saw their ribs. And one Dutch author then juxtaposed a picture of the Kuri, a person who was professionally a uh, care carrier, was called the Kuri. And of course, these people were dark skinned people. You could count them in because that's the way those people were. And for Dutch people, it was a, a situation of great crisis. And it hit me like a fist between the eyes because I thought, yeah, those people are skinny. That's the way they are. Uh, this is the bad faith of the colonial eye, you will say, or maybe the bad faith of the uh, elite's vision of the poor people. People's skin is the way they are. They feel fine that way. We have a real problem keeping as skinny as they are. But these, all these jokes, all these are ways of not of avoiding the realization of what things are like. And second, that these people might be very much more than you wish to think like you are yourself. Uh, so there is a whole gymnastics we do in trying to cope with what little, in, uh, what little information inspires. Uh, and those anthropologists or, uh, or activists or poets or artists who break through these rules of denial are spoiling the party as we bring it.
vagrant beggars you see in Scandinavia. I've already seen one in Les a young indigenous lady, of course. Um, well, I, these are my first steps since 20 years on your shore, so I'm not going to pose as an expert on the Swedish problem. But Sweden is very comfortably removed from the Mediterranean and all the Pacific. So it is Europe, a splendid isolated Europe, once over. And I know the Swedes couple this with a very acute social consciousness of the majority. Uh, the point is that when one would argue, let's open our frontiers for the Roman poor, that people will say, even by saying so, you are opening the gates for a flood of people who will invade Sweden or even the party towards him. And the fear motive of immigrants is extremely effective political mobilization. It's frightening effective. In fact, part of the complete disorganization of the social Christian, the social democratic left parties has been accomplished by systematically uh, creating images of fear for immigrants. We've had the polls, everybody was scared of the polls until the judge found out that the Poland, the so called Polish plumber, was a very good plumber indeed. And would come and he called him and charge only 30 each of 60 euros. And oh, yes, the polls would go back to Poland after a job well done. So now the Dutch are in love with the Poles. Uh, nevertheless, there was a scare of the Poles coming. Uh, this propaganda for, is so effective because, after all, the established in, in, in Europe or in America are just established by the skin of their teeth. They have a language, they want their children to go to school, they really would like them to do better than they do. And they feel, not at all like the rich of the world, they feel like people at the slightest country, the contrary event, will lose their privileged position. And that makes them so extremely sensitive for the threats of the migrant. By the way, migrant happens to be of uh, dark skin. This is a very important dimension of the frightening aspect. But even if they're light skinned, like the Poles, it works. So it's not a necessary, but it's a very auxiliary argument that they don't look like us. Maybe not a lot of you, but don't worry. And that is the major, so this is what you could call the racist or the colorist undercurrent. It is extremely effective. It is paralyzing center left movements in Europe and in America. Uh, and it is enormously amplified by what is going on in the Mediterranean because those drowning people do not symbolize individual victims. No, they symbolize the millions that are marching to take away the little wealth we have. Where 
I see people. There was an issue, I think, of um, dirt and pollution. Um, so you could call it fear, but it wasn't really fear in the sense of being afraid of what they might do to you, uh, which had, of course, to do with caste and uh, all of the um, all of the manual labor in the cities associated with it. Um, where I see a serious rise of fear is a gender fear, and it's gotten much bigger um, more recently. There's a terror of violence against women and of rape, and that is um, reaching panic levels um, uh, in many cities. Um, and it takes the form flying completely in the face of what we know, which is that the bulk of uh, violence against women and including sexual violence happens within the home. It doesn't happen. Uh, and it happens at the hands of people that the women knows uh, from before. But flying in the face of all of that, and in the uh, context of all of the cases that um, that in the press, there is definitely a rising fear of that, um, which is hitting, as I said, panic proportions. Um, it is associated, and I come from, I live in Bangalore, in the south. Um, there is in Bangalore, for a variety of reasons now, a big influx of uh, construction and other workers from the entire region. There is a terror of these uncivilized journeys coming from the north um, to our nice, uh, civilized southern cities, and you, we can never be sure what they will do. So there is that. And it's very different from the kind of, you know, ships in a, um, uh, 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 movements against Tamil workers in Mumbai and so on. That is not here. That is simply a straightforward, you know, they're taking away our jobs to get them out of here. This is actual fear. But it's very much a gender fear. And so there's influence in these, and it's, it would be interesting um, to know if how much this corresponds to what is there in other parts of the world that you study. Thank you, because you're confirming the suspicion I had. I was following in the New York Times the enormous indeed righteous indignation against the truly horrible things, uh, say, urban immigrant peasants did to women. And of course, it's horrible at the indignation. And then I thought, it's a very, very, very large indignation. Could it also be a nice and acceptable way of hating dark, lower class, rural workers who are coming to the city? More or less exactly what you say. And you made the statistic observation, which I would be very is correct, at least for, for Western society, that yes, uh, the abuse of women occurs much more often in, uh, in, at home uh, than it does in the streets, and statistically that's a much larger problem. Uh, so there may be kinds of discourses under that allow you to, to, to express your, your fear and loathing of strangers for example, under the guise of righteous feminism. There, but basically, it reads, they're sort of our women, which is about the oldest line in the book. And then, apparently, if you're sophisticated, you can mobilize feminist rhetoric uh, for, uh, for this, this world. Is that more or less, do you agree with my opinion? Um, I'm not sure, I don't think about it. Other is that amongst the elites, there could be ignorance or there could be romanticization. 
there is a constant, most of this constantly trying not to be too much aware of what's going on in the world, and if we are aware of it, not to feel too much responsible and to sort of wash our hands of it. That's only human. Uh, part of the solution to this is organization. The unions, the parties, the movements, and at present, uh, the tie is not this social democratic or social Christian organized movement. Uh, I may not have uttered the next word for the past three years. It's the word class struggle. Very old fashioned words. Younger people have to explain what it means. <laughs> but there is a class struggle going on, and it comes from the right. And then we two more questions. Is, is, uh, finally, after that, about the university, things like that, I have no question, I have no comment. I think you are working with the scholarship, and nice lecture, and I thank you all, and I congratulate you. Well, that's a great guy. <laughs> Thank you. 
there were movements which at least had a feeling of inspiration and courage. They had very courageous leaders. They had people who were willing to stand up for their rights and take risks. And it took some kind of perspective. Uh, also, in the struggle of the workers' movement in the West, there was the perspective which may have been a completely misleading perspective of communism. But in the West, communism did some good by the mistaken idea that it was doing good in the East. Uh, so illusions and realities come into try in strange ways. Uh, yeah, I don't know where that can come from. As I said, this is a moment in which class struggle comes from the right and the wings. Maybe at the very least if we realize that there is something like an opposition between the rich and those of less organs, that might already be a beginning when people could organize and they could move against it. 